So um, we're, you know, if you'd like us to come back on that subject, he has testified to the NRC. We've done several videos on that. And you're right, it's our tax dollars that's underwriting that infrastructure. Yes. Let me just say one thing on that. Um, I testified on, this, on these reactors down south, and I said they weren't safe. And, and one of the Georgia legislatures basically said, you know, he, he's a Yankee. What does he know? You know, this is our decision whether it's safe or not. You know, just go home, Yankee. And I'm fine with that, except they want my loan guarantee. Right. So as a Yankee, they want me to guarantee their money. But as a Yankee, they don't want me to say, I question the safety. You yeah. can't have it both ways. You know, the fact is, if you want to build a nuke in Georgia, don't ask me for a loan guarantee. Right. Yeah. And our, son, our nephew lives in Georgia and our daughter lives in South Carolina. So, yes, we do have family connections and real concerns as well. Yeah. But we're happy to come back on that. Okay. And, and, and um, I guess in, in, in our closing, I'd like to invite any viewers who, that look at this video, if they have questions, please uh, contact us. The contact information is on the website, fairwinds.com. And we're in the process of uh, revamping the website. We got a grant to uh, revamp, revamp it and make it more user-friendly and, and have more topics up there of an educational nature. Oh, thank you very much, Maggie Gunderson, Arnie Gunderson, and please come back. We would love to. Month. Thank you for thank having you. us. And now thank you viewers for watching this and take your information and do something with it. And uh, now we'll go to the, the video from Fairwinds Energy Education. Thank, thank you. you. Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds. Today I'd like to introduce a video by Ian Goddard, but before I do that, I want to talk about beer. Now that's not the stuff you drink, but it's B-E-I-R, and it stands for the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation, and it's a report from the National Academy of Sciences. What got me thinking about this were two disturbing news stories out of Japan. The first story comes from NHK, which is the major Japanese uh, radio television station. And the story reports that in Fukushima Prefecture, very, very high levels of radioactive cesium has been found in male cedar flowers. That's the tip of the cedar apparently is loaded with cesium. The data indicates that it's about a quarter of a million disintegrations per second in a kilogram of these cedar flowers. Now, that's pretty serious because, of course, in the spring, the flowers will, will, uh, will bud and that radioactive cesium will go airborne again. Now, what got my attention, though, was the Japanese response to that. And here's what NHK said. The agency reports this is not a great health hazard, as it is only about 10 times what a person would be exposed to from normal background in Tokyo. Now, there's all sorts of assumptions that go into that calculation, but to my mind, when you release a quarter of a million disintegrations per second of cesium into the air when the flowers burst, that should get public health attention. The second story is also um, from Japan, and this one from Japan Times, where um, radioactive grasshoppers have been detected in Fukushima Prefecture. Now the grasshoppers are contaminated to the tune of 4,000 disintegrations per second in a kilogram of grasshoppers. Now why is this important? The Japanese eat radioactive grasshoppers with their beer. Now the story goes on to say this. The scientists think it's safe to eat the bugs because they're usually in snack-sized portions, crunchy soy marinated locusts enjoyed with a cold mug of beer. Now, I think drinking beer is fine, but when, they, when the bug you're eating has 4,000 disintegrations per second of, um, of cesium, uh, that should be a concern to public health officials. That gets me to the issue of beer, biological effects of ionizing radiation. The beer report shows that radiation exposure and cancer rate are linear. What that means is it's proportional. The more radiation you get, the more cancer you're likely to, to get. The less can 
less cancers come from lower doses. So if this dose, this is cancer, the line goes up and down in a straight line. That's what Beer says. It's called the LNT, linear no threshold approach. And what that means in Beer is this. If somebody's exposed to 100 rem, that's one sievert, the chances of getting cancer are 1 in 10. If you cut that in 10, so if somebody gets one, gets 10 rem, that's 100 millisieverts, the chances of getting cancer are 1 in 100. Going down one more, if you get one rem of radiation, or about 10 millisieverts, the chances of a cancer are about 1 in 1,000. Now in Japan, the Japanese government is allowing people to go back into these radiation zones when the radiation exposure is 2 rem. What that means is that they're willing to say that your chance of getting cancer are 1 in 500 if you go back into these areas that are, um, are presently off limits and the exposure levels are, are 2 rem or 20 millisieverts in a, uh, in a year. But it's worse than that. The number for the, that we're using in the beer report is for the entire population, old people and young. And old people are going to die of something else before cancer gets to them, whereas young people have rapidly, uh, rapidly dividing cells and they live a longer time, so they're more likely to get cancer. So if you go into the beer report and you look at table 12D, you'll see that young women have it five times that number uh, chance of getting cancer than the population of, as a whole. So, so young girls in the Fukushima prefecture are going to get five times the exposure they would get from 2 rem. That means about one in a hundred young girls is going to get cancer as a result of the exposure in Fukushima prefecture. And that's for every year they're in that radiation zone. If you're in there for five years, it's five out of a hundred young girls will get cancer. Now, the Beer Report only addresses cancer, and of course there's other effects of radiation that are not included in beer, so it's actually worse than that. Two more items. The, the first is that the, the Beer Report does not address hot particles. Now, we've been over that extensively on the site, and you'll see that um, uh, you know, imbibing it, um, a kid gets radioactive cesium on their, on their hands and they swallow it, or breathing it in is not included in the beer report. And the last piece brings us over to Ian Goddard's video. And that's this assumption by the Japanese and uh, International Atomic Energy Agency that at some point this radiation is really so hard to measure it doesn't count anymore. Well, the, the data indicates that just the opposite is happening. And that brings me to Ian Goddard's video. I'll be back at the end of the video to try to summarize uh, everything we've talked about today. Following the Fukushima nuclear disaster, the Japanese government raised the level of allowable radiation exposure from 1 to 20 millisieverts per year, even for children. On April 19th, the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology announced that the amount of radiation a child can be exposed to in one year is 20 millisieverts. Officials proclaim that 20 millisieverts per year is safe, but is it? In this video, we'll test the official claim of safety against established radiobiological science the same science upon which the United States National Academy of Sciences predicts that 20 millisieverts of radiation will not only cause cancers all across Fukushima, but will primarily kill women and children. In this video, we'll also test the official claim of safety against recently published research, such as the largest study of nuclear workers ever conducted comprising over 400,000 workers from 15 countries. The study found increased cancer mortality among nuclear workers exposed to an average of 2 millisieverts per year. 
That's just one-tenth of the allegedly safe 20 millisieverts per year allowed in Fukushima. In this video, we'll see that the public is being misled by governments and major media into a false sense of safety regarding nuclear fallout, obstructing the ability of citizens to be fully informed so that we can make sound decisions that direct our democracies to safe energy futures. So stay tuned as we cover all that and more. The United States National Academy of Sciences is a logical resource to consult about the state of radiation science. And the Academy regularly publishes reports on low-dose radiation risks. The reports are based on decades of epidemiological and radiobiological research from which risk predicting models are built. The Academy's most recent report provides both raw data and instructions so that you can apply their risk models to a wide range of exposure scenarios. We can therefore find the cancer risk of 20 millisieverts. This is the Academy's data table for estimated cancer cases caused by 100 millisieverts of radiation stratified by age and segregated by sex. Highlighted in yellow are the predicted number of cases for all cancers per 100,000 persons. Immediately we can see that the risk of cancer uniformly decreases as age increases for both males and females. In other words, children are most vulnerable to radiation. Plotting these data yields this graph. This cancer risk graph keeps the shape irrespective of its dose. This shape is therefore the face of radiation-induced cancer risk across the human lifespan. Following the Academy's instructions on scaling the model to specific doses, the y-axis is recalibrated to the predicted cancer cases caused by the allegedly safe 20 millisieverts. And here in turn are recalibrations for 10 and for 2 millisieverts. According to the Academy, there is no harmless dose of radiation. So, obviously 20 millisieverts is not safe. But what's most remarkable is that children and most especially girls, are the most at risk of radiation-induced cancer. In fact, girls are almost twice as vulnerable as same-aged boys, and a five-year-old girl is five times, and an infant female seven times more vulnerable than a 30-year-old man. These data from the National Academy of Sciences are freely available to all major media and government officials. Yet rather than informing the public of the actual state of radiation science and the real risks of nuclear power, they lead us instead to believe that 20 millisieverts of radiation is either safe or its effects are a complete mystery. Residents travel to Tokyo to protest after the government loosened safety limits despite the fact that the long-term impact of low-dose radiation is unknown. The long-term impact of low-dose radiation is unknown. Even worse than a failure to inform, major media lead the public to believe that scientific models of low-dose radiation risk, such as we've just reviewed, don't even exist. Yet outside the media's cocoon of blissful ignorance, science marches forward, further characterizing the risks of low-dose radiation. And the flow of incoming evidence, published since the Academy's last report in 2006, suggests that the Academy's risk model is either accurate or may underestimate risk. 